thanks very much for the kind of introduction. And uh, I have to say, this is really a very special meeting because uh, this is the only one where we get so closely involved with uh, the families and the patients. So it's always special to come here. Um, so in the beginning, I wanted to show you that uh, I'm not alone here. This is the picture of my group. And as you can see here, two of them, Lena and Marcel, they're also here in the audience sitting in the back. Um, and some of you might remember that last year in Philadelphia, Robert had been uh, our representative in a way. Um, I couldn't come, but he was there for us. All right, so before I start talking about um, genes and genomes and proteins, I want to come back and uh, fulfill the promise to give you some information about how you can access um, publications, how you can search them on the internet. The best way to do that is really do a web search with the phrase PubMed, you can see here, and then you go on, a home, on the homepage of PubMed, which is a US-based site where you can search for publications, research publications, and then you put in the keyword poor alpha. You could also do Pura, but there are authors with the same last name, so that would be rather confusing. Punch in Pura Alpha, and then you get a list of publications. This is an example where we picked one of the mutations, uh, one of the uh, publications, um, Margot's paper, and as you can see here, you get an abstract, you get the authors, the title, the authors, you get an abstract, so this is always for free. Um, but then, in some cases, you have a link to an open access full version of the, uh, of the, of the, of the um, paper. And this is shown here. So you click that link, and you come to end up with a journal, and you have the full version. If you don't have access to a full version of the uh, publication, there are two options. Either you are an alumni of a US-based university, then usually you have access to several subscription-based journals, or alternatively, ask the corresponding author or the Pura Foundation who might be willing to, to buy a copy of that publication. So these are the options. Um, right. And with this, I would like to um, pick up what I wanted to talk about in, um, initially, and which is to explain a little bit or to bring some systematic understanding to what it is about the Pura gene, the Pura alpha, Pura repeats, Pura domains. This must be all very confusing to you guys, and I think uh, it would be good to have some systematic explanation of that. And that's what I'm going to try, and I hope I'm successful. OK, so let's start simple. This is a human cell, and as you can see here, um, there is some kind of lightly colored um, um, cell here, and there's always a black dot or a dark dot in the middle. So this will be the shape of a cell. And when you draw a cartoon about what you're seeing there, then you will see that the dark dot you find everywhere here and here, that this is called the nucleus. So it's like a little ball sitting in the middle of the, of the cell. And this nucleus contains the genes and our chromosomes. So the nucleus contains chromosomes with the genes on it. The surrounding is called cytoplasm, right? You find that here, or here, or here. Cytoplasm is actually where most of the proteins, so the molecular machines that keep a cell doing what it's supposed to be doing, and that nerve cell and muscle cell, and these uh, proteins are mostly in the cytoplasm. There's some in the nucleus, but most of them are outside here. So this is where this, uh, how the cell is organized. And we learned that, obviously, the genes are in the nucleus. The question is, what are they doing? You can compare it to a construction plan. Um, genes in the nucleus are construction plans for molecular machines. So that would be the construction plan, and, um, and this would be the machine you built. So it's a steam engine, as you can see here. Um, and the equivalent to the steam engine would be the proteins in the cell, so the cellular machines. If we put that into the drawing, you know, it would be the genes are the construction plans for the proteins that are working in the cytoplasm. And as it is with building construction plans, um, once you have a plan once, you know, you can actually um, make multiple machines with the same building plan. And that is also what the cell is doing. You have 
multiple of the pro multiple proteins um, being um, built from one gene. So it's a quite efficient way of amplifying that information. All right. So we have the information that the genes encode the proteins. For pro alpha, this means the gene is called pura, and the protein is called pro alpha. So that is what you have to recognize, to memorize also. Um, and I think the, the best way you can remember this is by simply looking at the Pura logo, huh? the Pura Foundation logo, because you see that there is Pura written, and it's encircled by DNA. It's a double helix DNA. So when you're not sure what is, what, which is which, um, and you wonder if Pura Alpha is the protein or the gene, look at the logo and you see it's Pura encircled by DNA, and then you're sure about that. Good. Chromosomes. As I said, these are the physical location of the genes. We have 23 chromosomes um, in pairs, one coming from the mother, one coming from the father, and you can see that they're colored in a different way, um, and you always have pairs, right? Here, 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 here. When we zoom in into these chromosomes, then of course our favorite chromosome would be number five, because that is where poor alpha is located, right? And this is kind of a, a map of a chromosome, which starts here, here, and you can see that there is a kind of a constricted region, which we call the center here. And there, um, we, we use this as an orientation point. This is important for during cell division, um, and you find it in, in all the chromosomes. We take that as an orientation point. And you can see that we have a shorter arm and a longer arm here. Um, the shorter arm is called P arm. Um, P stands for petit, which is French, means small. So it's a small arm. And the Q arm is the long one. Pura, the Pura gene is located here in position Q31.2. And the le deletion that had been described before reaches, from, uh, reaches to uh, Q31.3. So the Pura gene is located here. And you want to certainly know how that looks like, right? So let's have a look. And you see, it's letters. It's only letters. This is the way how we kind of describe the gene. Um, you can look at that and see that we have four types of letters there. We have A, T, Gs, and Cs. So four types of letters which are uh, in the long chain, and this make, these make a gene. The beginning is always beginning of every gene is always an ATG. So this is kind of a start sign. And we always have, at the end, uh, a stop sign. And that defines the gene as such. All right, um, so lots of information. And it's not really comprehensible, I would guess, right? So let's understand that in a better way, or put that into perspective, how big that would be. And um, what people did was simply printing all the letters of an entire genome. So from a single cell, and put that into book chapters. And this is what you can see at the Welcome to a Collection in London, where here you have an entire bookshelf filled with letters, A, T, Gs, and Cs. And what you see is you have the two, 22 chromosomes plus or X and Y chromosomes. And of course, for us, the most interesting ones will be um, some chapter in uh, chromosome 5 or in the books that have the number 5. So we would zoom in here. And the Pura, Pura gene would be a single page, a single page in one of these books. So you can imagine this is a tiny bit of information in a vast amount of, of data or large uh, uh, um, genome. And the mutation that potentially could generate or produce the Pura syndrome would be, could be as small as a single letter exchange in that uh, on, in, on that page. So you can imagine how difficult it must have been for the geneticists, for the DD studies, to identify that Pura is really the gene responsible for uh, the Pura syndrome. Um, and how, what, a, what a daunting task that is. It's a needle in a haystack. Right. So then let's see how genes are functioning. Um, you see here, the upper row is called gene. And the lower one is called protein. You see arrows. So what does it mean? We know that genes are encoding information. And it's always three letters that make one R. The 
let's say, one, one building block, right? They encode one building block. So you always jump in a pairs of, of, of three, and that has a, a, um, contains the information. And three letters always encode or mean one building block on the protein side. So you see ATG is always a methionine, C, uh, GCG is always an adenine, um, alanine, sorry, um, and so on and so on. Um, so this is a very defined translation that you do there. And that means that the protein is actually a chain of these letters here. Um, and compared to the gene, as you can see here, we not only have four possibilities, A, T, G, and C, but we have 20 different letters we can use. So there's more variation in there. So what happens if there is a mutation coming in? The gene is changed in one of the letters. Let's do that. You see, the C becomes an A. And guess what is happening? Does anybody know? Yes, right. So the identity of this building block of this amino acid would change, right? So the serine would become an arginine, right? And this is where the mutation happens. In other words, a G mutation alters the protein sequence and by doing so potentially also its function. That's the take home message here. So what impact could, have, uh, could such a, a mutation have on a protein? And there are two options, right? The first option is, well, it's not an important gene that is hit. Uh, the protein doesn't have any essential function and so a mutation doesn't cause any major problems, right? So you would have a uh, probably no disease coming out of that. The second option, and this is what the Perot syndrome is about, is when you have a mutation that impairs the function of an important protein. So obviously, pro-alpha, the protein, not the gene, is the gene, as you remember here, is the Perot gene, as you can see here from the, from the logo. So the pro-alpha protein obviously is important, and that means a mutation in the Perot gene causes an effect, a defect in the pro, pro, pro alpha protein, and the result is the poor syndrome. Some more things to say about mutations, some important information for you to put that into perspective, because you are the parents of kids that have these mutations. It is important to understand that mutations occur naturally. That is part of our evolution, right? So every once and then we get mutations in our genomes and that is the driving force behind evolution. That allowed us to start walking upright and um, to develop in the last 200,000 years as human beings and having, or gaining consciousness and so on. It is the opportunity for us to change, to uh, advance. With the downside that a lot of the mutations, of course, don't make sense, don't help. It's just few of them that give us an advantage. Um, and it's, uh, that is what, what drives evolution. It has been measured how many mutations actually occur when the parents um, um, come together with the chromosomes and there's a fertilization of the new egg. It has been measured that there are dozens of mutations of genetic alterations uh, in the new generation, so when the kid comes, um, that the kid has dozens of mutations. Um, this is not always bad, as I said. In most of the cases, this is not a problem, but once in a while, um, a gene is hit that is important. The important thing here is to understand that this is, again, part of our evolution, right? And that means your behavior during pregnancy did not cause a pure mutation. You did not and could not do anything actively on that. It is a natural process, right? So the question then is why is a mutation in a gene and a changed amino acid sequence, why is that um, affecting a function of a cell? I mean, you know that these are more like machines, but in order to understand really what's going on upon a mutation, it is also essential that you understand something about how these um, entities, so the genes and the proteins, are actually folding what their three-dimensional structure is. Let's start with a gene. A gene is actually, or DNA, is actually formed by a double-stranded uh, double alpha helix. So you can see that here. Um, and you can see in the middle that there are sticks with different colors. There are four different colors, and guess what? 
These four different colors represent the four different letters that we have here, A, T, G, and C. Uh, so this is actually a stable and very constant uh, um, um, structure. It's always a double-stranded helix. And a mutation would not change that. The DNA would be happy with that, you know, the DNA by itself. You would just change the information for the protein. And you would end up with a di different building block. This was a serine that was changed into an arginine. And in order to understand why this could be a problem, you have to see how a protein looks like. Because a protein is, of course, also formed as a long chain, as you can see here. Um, and you can see that, obviously, along this chain, there are th different things sticking out. And these side chains, as we call them, these are the ones that make the difference, the difference in identity. So these are lysines, for instance, um, but you have other amino acids that have different side chains, and they're represented by different letters up here, right? Here's a little Mickey Mouse, as you can see. The important thing is that these chains, these protein chains, can also fold, but they can fold in a much more variable way. So let's look at that. You see, this is the linear one, and now it's folding also into such a helix, right? And you can see that it's stabilizing it by hydrogen bonds, so it glues itself together. But it can also fold in a very different way. This is a so-called beta sheet. So you have different ways of organizing that in three dimensions. And if you have several of those motifs, several of these folding entities, you can build complex three-dimensional structures. And such a thing here is also called a protein domain. So a folded entity is a protein domain. And if you have a mutation, you know, you would change something in that structure, and this might end up uh, in a folding problem so that this domain is not folded correctly. So the molecular machine cannot function correctly. That's behind the effect of a mutation in the gene um, on a protein. Now we've learned quite a bit about how structures look like and what that is and so on and why it's important. And of course we're here on the Pura conference, so the important question is how does Pura Alpha look like? So let's go for that. Best thing would be to have a microscope, a huh? microscope with atomic resolution. Um, unfortunately, that does not exist. Um, and remember, Pura Alpha is the protein, right? It's not the gene because the gene, the Pura gene, as in the logo, and it is DNA. So Pura Alpha is the protein. As I said, we don't have a microscope, so what do we do? There is a trick, and the trick is called X-ray crystallography. That is something that has been developed about 100 years ago already, first of all, to look at inorganic materials, but then in the last 50, 60 years, it has been increasingly used to also study proteins, DNA, RNA, and so on. And I will just show you how this thing works, roughly, and then how we can use it for understanding pro-alpha. So indeed, we have to form, to build crystals, to grow crystals from proteins. That sounds a bit odd, I think, huh? all right? Yeah. So you know crystals from salt or from sugar. These are also crystals. But you're able, with a lot of tricks, um, and it is not easy, but you can do it, to um, convince proteins, who are like these folded domains, to also organize themselves in a very uh, well-organized and oriented manner um, so that they end up in a, a crystal lattice, as we call it. And what you see there is these crystals. I should say they're small, they're rather small. So they're in the size of uh, half a millimeter or small or tenth of a millimeter, um, and um, only then uh, we're able to work with that. So we take these crystals and we try to solve the structure based on that. And the way we do is that we shoot x-rays on them, and we need very strong x-rays. And we need a very big microscope for that. It's so big that it actually fills an, an, an entire landscape, as you can see here. So this is Grenoble with the rivers, and the roundish thing here, this is our microscope. So it's huge. X-ray is really strong, so is a, a a million are multiplied by a billion fold stronger than a hospital x-ray, and it is thinner than a hair. Now, this is funny, right? This is uh, the smaller the sample is, you want to look at the protein, the bigger the machine has to be. Um, let's look into this. Um, so 
we have a close-up in the next slide of uh, this part here. And as you can see here, it's a huge hall. And we even have bikes to go around uh, because uh, it would be difficult to walk uh, all the way, right? If the, if the coffee machine is on the other side, you know, it is quite difficult and wait takes a long time. The coffee is cold until you're back. Right, so um, you see lots of things here, but the important thing are these boxes. Because in these boxes are the laboratories in which we solve the structures and take the data sets. So let's look inside there. You see, uh, it's filled with things, and this is what we call here the opti optical table, where the x-rays can come in. And then there in the back, there's something orange. And if we zoom in there, you will see that there is Franzi, our PhD student, or former PhD student, I have to say. And she's currently mounting crystals in this machine. Um, and then once she's mounted that, she would leave the room, lock the door, and then we can shoot the x-rays on the crystal. She's shooting crystals by um, um, using computers in the control room. And you'll see there's lots of screens and things to change and to take care of. And then if we see good data, you know, we're happy. This is Robert just discovering a very nice data set. What is he happy about? And that's probably the, the funny thing about scientists. We can be happy about very strange things. And in this case, it's a diffraction pattern. You know, These are little tiny spots. And you can see that um, they're very well defined. For us, this is a great data set. Because if we take hundreds of these data sets or hundreds of these pictures from a crystal, always from a different angle, um, we can reconstruct on the computer the protein that was responsible for these diffraction patterns, as we call them. So we go back with the data on our hard drive and then solve the structure with um, on a 3D computer and then build the models that you see. And what we end up is a 3D structure that we can show you, like for Pro Alpha. Before I show you the structure, I should tell you also how the whole thing is organized, the protein. Um, because now we come into the field where we have to talk about poor repeats and poor domains. And we have to make this distinct distinction to understand what we are talking about. So um, the protein has a start, which we call N-terminus, and this, an end, right, the C-terminus. So this is the front, this is the back. What we found is that there are repeating sequence areas that we call poor repeats, um, which we, uh, there are three times repeating. So poor repeat one, poor repeat two, poor repeat three. And we found that you need two of these poor repeats, join them together to build a poor domain. So a three-dimensionally folded structure. And this is what you see here. The poor domain consists of poor repeat one, shown in green, and poor repeat two, shown um, in blue. And what you also see is that you have these little arrows here, the beta sheets, as I explained to you before, four of them followed by an alpha helix, right? The very same thing for the blue one. And you can imagine this, or yeah, um, envision this as um, something like a hand. You have the four beta sheets. They're like your four fingers. And the thumb would be the alpha helix. So you have one hand, the green one, the left hand, for instance, um, being poor repeat one. And then you have the same again for poor repeat two, uh, four fingers and the alpha helix being the thumb. And then you do uh, something like a molecular handshake. So they both interact. And with this, you get the formation of a three-dimensional domain. So this is how it works. Right. What we did then for Margot, David Hunt, and Diana, um, who had this very nice paper, together also with people from the foundation, right? This is a, a really a joint effort. You see here Cecile being involved, Mel being involved. So this is scientists and the foundation working together on scientific publications. I think this is quite, uh, quite amazing. Yeah. And what we could contribute to that, um, it's a little contribution, but I think it's, it's, a, it's actually a neat one, is that we could look at the mutations and then the mutations that have been described in the patients there and make a structural interpretation of what is going wrong in the folding of these domains. And you can see here one example, I think a quite dramatic example, because a gray, this would be the normal folding of the protein that we know. And then this thin red line, this is 
amino acids are part of the protein that are missing in this mutation. So all this is missing. And you can imagine that if you have a part here and the part here, um, and all the stuff in between missing, that this cannot fold correctly. Yeah? This will be unfolded, and cell will, the cell will recognize it and then destroy it. And this is why this protein is not functional. And we did that for a number of mutations. And I'm bringing that up because Margot had mentioned it. Um, and we classified them according to the type of mutation and uh, the expected effects. So we have um, so-called class one mutations, we have class two mutations. And what you see is that each of these triangles is actually one mutation. Huh? So you see a number of mutations. For some of them, we have several cases, um, but they would still be represented by a single triangle. We have here the blue type point mutations in the DNA RNA binding domain and in the dimerization domain, which I will not explain to you. And last but not least, we have some surface mutations, as we call them, a green ones. Our hope was, and Margot had mentioned already that we did not succeed in that, our hope, our hope was that by making the classifications, we could actually match that with the symptoms that the patients have, huh? because there is great variation from patient to patient. Um, and we thought perhaps that mutations in poor repeat three, for instance, um, would be correlated with certain type of uh, symptoms and uh, that this would be distinguishable from other types of mutations. Unfortunately, based on the type of mutations and the structures, we cannot predict yet the symptoms you uh, that your child might develop. The key message is here, we still don't understand enough about this to, to resolve that riddle. But we're working on it. All right, so where do we go from here? This is things that we have been doing and they have been published also. Um, the question is more like, where do we want to go from here, right? And in order to do that, um, I want to point out that cells are complicated. This is a nerve cell. You see here in the, here in the middle, this is the nucleus. And you see that there's all kinds of things hanging around here, all kinds of molecular machines that you have here, um, these extensions uh, with the synapses where neurons, nerve cells talk to other nerve cells, and these networks is what makes our cell, uh, our brain, right? Um, it is very complicated. This is the take home message here. You can actually compare that to, to a city where you have lots of transport going on and lots of cross talking um, between people and so on. And, uh, can imagine that it's not easy to um, really dis uh, 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 disentangle that and, and find out what ProAlpha is doing exactly. So our plan, what we want to do is, uh, is to, to listen to ProAlpha in a way. Um, it's like um, analyzing a WhatsApp, uh, uh, your WhatsApp groups. You, know? you give us your handy, me your handy, I look at the WhatsApp groups you're in, and I can tell something about your social interactions, your interests, and perhaps also about your profession. And this is pretty much what we're doing. Um, next slide is on uh, is taken from a textbook. And what you can see here is yeah, the cross-talking between proteins. So if your protein of interest would be this protein here, SKP1, which is an adapter protein, obviously, uh, you see it's involved in different things. It's interacting with these people here, with these proteins, I have to say. Um, protein WhatsApp groups would be interesting. Um, it is involved in something that is called labeled with a function connector core and for instance cell cycle regulators. And so from knowing with which other proteins um, the poor alpha protein is interacting, we would learn quite a lot about its function. Huh? And this is needed for us to understand what goes wrong in patients. So where are we with poor alpha? The bad news is just at the very beginning. So this is an interaction map that has been drawn for a cell we have no idea where in this map ProAlpha is. Um, so we have to start dis um, disassembling that and, and finding out what the networks are. And we want to do that for the normal ProAlpha protein, right? Um, and build such a map and then identify the cellular functions of ProAlpha. But we also want to do that with a mutated ProAlpha protein. So this is shown here, the principle. It's a, 
in general, just what I described to you, but just made simpler, because we hope it's simpler than what I show you, right? So in the normal, healthy version of the Pura gene, Pura gene, you know, this is the DNA Pura. Um, the protein will be also okay. And it would have a certain set of interaction partners, friends as you wish, as you will. Um, in Pura Alpha, with a mutation, with a Pura mutation, you know, shown here by this red aster asterisk, some of these interactions are likely not to be present. And we want to find out what is missing, what is different. And from the comparison, we will learn something about what causes, the, what triggers the disease. So, summary here, we first need to find out what is different in Pura cells. We need to find out what, what the molecular problems are. And in order to do so, of course, we want to understand the interaction networks here, but we will do that, all that analysis, very, by very different means. We use animal models, this is our work by Jennifer Gordon, for instance. Stem cells, you will hear that our lab is doing that uh, in the next talk from Lena. Biochemistry, structures, and so on. And the idea is that we put all of the information together and then get a more holistic view on the differences and commonalities between healthy and, um, and disease state cells. All right. This information then will be collected, and this is where the patient's registry and the biobank comes into play. You will hear about that this afternoon. Um, because we want to collect this information, bring them together, but then also match them with you, what you will be telling us, um, the information you have about um, what the problems with the kids are, what are the disease um, specifics are. Um, and we would also match that with clinical data from your medical doctor. And the idea of the foundation, uh, they're building this up right now, is that you have one big bin where you put that in. We call that patient registry and biobank for biological samples. And then you can really collect and understand um, what is different, what's, uh, what's, what's causing the disease um, on a functional level. So find out what's going wrong. And then if you know what is going wrong, you also have an idea what could be, what chances you have to correct that. All right, and with this I'm done. Um, as you can see here, the, uh, <laughs> this is a typical lab bench from our lab um, that uh, the Pura kids and the Pura Foundation have, uh, well, <laughs> profoundly infested our lab um, and their major driving force here. Um, and with this, I'd like to thank you for listening to me and uh, thank again the Foundation for inviting us and um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.